This is a recording of a live Zoom presentation given by the Seed Library of Los Angeles Altadena branch. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. Welcome everybody, good morning. Um, this is our monthly workshop slash presentation meeting um, for the Seed Library of Los Angeles Altadena. My name is Jessica. Um, and we meet every month. Um, we've been meeting remotely for oh, a year and a half now since uh, the COVID crisis started, um, but we are planning to return to in-person meetings with a live streaming component, um, thanks to the Altadena Library, um, back in May. So next month for April, um, we are going to skip our presentation and kind of go on a mini hiatus so we can get prepared for our hybrid um, meeting starting up at May. So the in-person portions will be taking place um, at the Altadena Library's main branch um, in the community room. And we hope to make a virtual option available as well. Um, we have it in the works and it'll be a little bit of, a, of an experiment <laughs> the first time around. Um, but hopefully we can get all the kinks worked out and, and have a smooth um, live stream option as well. Um, as always, um, when I'm done talking, I'll put all of our contact info in the chat. Um, we have a membership form, um, an email, our Instagram account, so you know how to get a hold of us. And I'm going to put a shout out for volunteers. I'm actually want to introduce our volunteers because I haven't in a long time. So um, we have a mighty crew that a lot goes on behind the scenes to keep the library running. Um, Sue does our, she's waving her hand, um, a lot of our promotions. She puts together our little promos. She's uh, our outreach person. Um, I forget, I'm lot, just sort of fills in everywhere. <laughs> when, when, there, when there's a problem, I say, Sue, help. <laughs> um, Deborah, she does uh, gets a lot of our um, stuff ready for our seed mailing. So she gets all the envelopes ready, gets it all organized to make our seed packing and mailing process smooth. And Greg, who's our newest volunteer, he um, has been putting together our email newsletters, which is amazing. So thank you, Greg. And Gina, Gina does a little bit of everything. <laughs> um, she helps with seed packing. We had a table at the Altadena Library. She does some outreach. And she also um, does a wonderful overview of our, our library and our seed library process. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Gina. I'm gonna spotlight you. I forgot to uh, do that. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so a little background. Um, SLOLA is the Seed Library of Los Angeles, and we're a not-for-profit local organization based here in LA. Um, and we're really now centered on the east side here. Um, we, before COVID, we're meeting at the Altadena Library and we'll resume so in two months. And while we do have lead organizers, um, we really are a collective, so that means that we're growing with the model that depends on participation from our community, which is everybody here. Um, the goals of SLOLA, we um, <clears throat> are aiming to grow acclimated seeds to our specific bioregion and climate, so as to cultivate crops and plants that are more resilient, hardy, and fruitful, because they're naturalized to our weather right here on the east side. And that process takes about seven seasons. Um, we're also interested in building a community of gardeners and people invested in food security, habitat restoration, and wildlife, as well as a network of knowledge and wisdom so that we can cultivate communal resiliency for us humans and the legacy of the seeds that we're growing and the wildlife that we cohabitate with. Um, <clears throat> how SOLO works. Our meetings are always free um, to attend, and they're once a month, first Saturday. We have speakers each month who will share on various topics that we find relevant to our mission. And we also factor in what you guys want to learn about. And then to be a member, you just have to live in the LA area here um, in the vicinity that you could technically attend a, an in-person meeting. And then um, you'd pay a one-time $10 donation fee and that allows you to check out four varieties of seeds each month. And we use the term check out because our intention is that you'll be returning seeds um, so as to contribute to our growing seed library. Um, we get many of our seeds from companies like Baker Creek and um, 
we'd love to grow other sections of our library, like our native uh, California natives, um, flowers and medicinal and herbal seeds. And then um, to return a seed, it must be open pollinated, organic, non-GMO. And if you have questions for that, we do have a handy PDF that we can send you. Just reach out um, via email and Jessica will include that information in the chat. And I will turn it back to Jessica. Great, thank you, Gina. I almost forgot we have a poll that we like to give out at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, it's just a quick anonymous poll that, that uh, there's just three questions. Uh, it gives us a sense of um, how you found out about the meeting, where you're located. Um, so I just, I've just launched it. So if you could just take a quick few seconds and answer those questions, um, that helps us uh, know, you know where you're finding us. And, and uh, if you're a member or not a member, um, that sort of thing. So I'll let that go. Um, and while that's going, um, I'll go ahead and introduce our presenter. Today we have Kristen Guy. She's a certified master gardener and a certified horticulturalist. Um, she's written for a number of publications and I am excited about her um, presentation. I think there's always something to learn. Um, so I will go ahead and I'm gonna hand it over to you and I'm gonna end our poll. Let's see, so here you go, Kristen, and I'm gonna end the poll. Good morning, everybody. Uh, fellow gardeners and plant people, I see some familiar faces in the room and I see some new friends and I'm really excited to talk about garden prep with you today. Uh, you know, a lot of us have different levels of gardening abilities and experience. And a lot of us have a lot of thoughts of what garden prep is and what it could be. Uh, so today my goal is for you to take away one or two things that might be new to you, uh, whether you're a first time gardener or you've been gardening for decades. Uh, we're gonna talk about a lot of different things. So I'm gonna try to move through, through different content pretty quickly. However, if you have questions on one specific thing that we're talking about, please either raise your hand, put a question in the chat. We're gonna take some time as we go and answer your questions because I really want all of you to benefit from this hour we have together. It's gonna to be like a power hour. It's gonna be very fast. Um, hopefully I don't black out and talk about compost for an hour. I, I won't. Uh, and um, I'm really excited to share some ideas that might take you outside of just what you think is garden prep and the long-term goals that you can start implementing in your garden. So. I'm going to start sharing my presentation. All right, can everyone see that? I'm going to say yes. yes. Yeah, I okay. Can. Perfect. So, you know, everybody has a different idea of what gardening experience can be. And I had a, I had a professor in uh, my horticulture program that at the beginning of every session, she asked, how many plants have you killed? And everyone sheepishly was like, oh, I haven't killed anything because you know I'm supposed to be the expert. And the truth is, is the more plants that you have had trials and tribulations with is the more experience that you have. And I want you guys all to understand that whether you're a beginner or you're still learning, the thing is, is that we're all still learning. So whatever you can pull out from today, I really hope that you find something that speaks to you. All right, so when we think about garden checklists and trying to start garden prep in our minds, uh, this is especially important if you're starting a new garden, if you're expanding your garden, if you wanna try to do something completely different. Uh, and this might seem just you know, very obvious to some, but planning and scheduling is such an important part of your success in the garden. Um, when you're thinking about growing a vegetable garden, really take into consideration what you like to eat or buy at the farmer's market. If you are really passionate about growing cut flowers, think about the list of colors and the types of bouquets that you like to give to friends and family or have on your kitchen table. The goal here is to stay focused. I know a lot of us have already purchased our seeds for the season, but it is very easy very easy to get distracted as those catalogs continue to come in because they want you to keep buying more. So always stay focused, make a list and a plan for everything that you want to grow as essential. And then from there, if you have extra space, start thinking about your experiments, some new produce, some new flowers, and we're gonna get into some other ideas about natives and pollinators later in this presentation. Uh, and with that being said, I find it very helpful to keep a journal. And it doesn't have to be something very formal. 
You don't even have to spend the money to buy a legitimate garden journal. Get yourself a, a notepad, make notes every season because sometimes we're trying new things. Sometimes we're trying tomatoes in a new location and they didn't work. Sometimes things aren't getting enough sun that we thought that they might. Uh, I think it's very important for you to start having a relationship with your garden, whether it's raised beds, a large garden pot, plot, or even just a patio or balcony, and what trials and tribulations, success stories, and frustrations you had, and revisiting those every year as you're planning your new garden, because that's really going to set you up for continual success, rather than making the same mistakes over and over, because really the goal here is taking enjoyment out of learning what worked and what didn't, and trying something new the next season. So I thought I'd just dive in first about something very specific, and that is most of us, I think, are here in California, Southern California zones 9 through 11. Uh, so this is going to be your March spring prep checklist outside of the garden beds. Uh, I think so many times we are so focused on growing vegetables or our fruit trees or other things, and I think that the overall health and maintenance of your property and your surrounding garden area is something also to consider. And right now, March, is the perfect time and actually kind of the cutoff time before we're starting to get these warmer temperatures. Granted, everything is subject to change, right? It rained last night, it's freezing this morning, it's not freezing, it's cold this morning for me, I'm sorry, Southern California wimpy. Um, and we really need to kind of focus on some other things before all of our attention and it's go time in the spring and summer months in our garden, we're really focused on other things. So that being said, for March, uh, it's a great time to do pruning. I will say, unfortunately, with some of the heat spikes that we've had here in Southern California, a lot of our fruit trees and other budding trees have gone and broken bud some earlier than we anticipated than others. Um, so right now, if you have grapes and roses, if you haven't already pruned those, it's a great time to do that by removing old canes on your berry bushes as well. Uh, if you have ornamental grasses, this is a great time to tend to those before new growth starts. Uh, and if you do have fruit trees, I think it's a little late right now to get in there, but you can take this time to see if there are any dead or diseased or damaged branches because those won't have any new uh, leaf buds forming on them and you can take care of by removing those. Right now is also a great time to divide and conquer. And I mean specifically with your herb gardens. And this is if you have small container gardens or you have a raised bed full, uh, this is a great time to, if you're growing thyme, oregano, mint, rhubarb, chives, tarragon, lovage, marjoram, a lot of things that we can overwinter here in California, uh, digging those up, breaking them apart and replanting and transplanting into either new areas, sharing them with others. It's a really great time to pay attention to that before the growth starts again and uh, making more room for new planting. Uh, a lot of people have questions about fertilizing and feeding time. Uh, I would say March is a great time for berry, roses, citrus, and your camellias, things that are really starting to produce. Uh, and any established shrubs and um, other plantings around your garden, uh, compost and mulch. I think compost and mulch is your best bet, especially every spring, every fall. You want to help feed the plant as it goes into a very productive growing season, and you want to reward it at the end in the fall as it goes into dormancy or is done with its production cycle. Uh, in terms of larger scale landscaping in your garden, little bit end of the time for bare root tree plantings, but you still can get those in the ground. But if you're looking to add some new perennials and maybe even a couple natives, I would stick to maybe more of the salvias uh, for that. Um, they can be added up until April. Just be careful with how you're planting those and giving them a good established start before we hit these hot months. Uh, and then one last thing, I know a lot of us as gardening interested people, you might have three or 300 plants indoors. So before all of our attention goes towards the outside in these spring and summer months, this is a really great time to kind of observe and pay attention to your plant family inside uh, and give them a little extra care. Uh, we tend to forget about this. A lot of people feel like I can't, I can't keep my house plants alive. They're just as important as your outside plants. This is a great time to assess if they need to be upsized in a pot if you need to give them a little liquid fertilizer, uh, a little extra soil, and most importantly, with uh, our indoor plant and our environment with so many open windows, giving the leaves a little dusting and cleaning uh, just to set them off on the right foot. And this is something you can do once or twice a year, more so if you can remember it, but spring is always a good time to remember that before you get distracted outdoors. I can't see the chat box since I'm in full screen mode. So if anybody has any questions uh, and my lovely volunteer team, if you could just wave at me and 
interrupt me, please do uh, as we continue on because I can't quite see everything right now with my full screen mode. We've got a couple of questions, but I think it's okay for them to wait a little bit because you might okay. cover them later. Okay. Uh, just one quick thing a lot of people do think about in terms of garden prep is your gear maintenance. Uh, right now before, you know, spring and summer are, are heavy, fast and furious growing seasons. Uh, so this is a really great time before we're starting new batches of seeds and other, uh, other garden maintenance projects, polishing up your shears and knives. Uh, I really love, I have a little ritual I do every spring and fall, and that's pulling out um, a buff pad and some camellia oil and really taking my harvesting um, knives and shears and, and, and really shining them up because they, they take a beating during the uh, summer specifically. Uh, what, is seeds, camellia, what is camellia or oil? It is, is oil made from camellia. <laughs> it is actually used um, more traditionally. I think it's used in uh, bonsai uh, and knife polishing, but it works wonders. And it was uh, recommended to me years ago by a professional florist to use for my garden tools as well. Uh, if you just use a little buff pad, if you have any tools that have a little bit of rust or a little bit of wear and tear on it, wash it off first, get it dry, use a buffing pad, and then you, you clean it with a rag and some of the oil and they look as good as new. It's really quite amazing. Um, in terms of your seed trays and your potting tools, it is important to disinfect them. We don't think that because we can't see anything, uh, but set yourself up for, for germination success and let's disinfect those. There's a couple of ways you can do it. Of course, wash it with soap and water first or a good hose spray. Uh, there are, you can use alcohol uh, for your shears between pruning jobs, that's the shear part, and then for the actual seed starting trays. A lot of people like to use a chlorine bleach four parts water. Uh, some people like to just throw a cap full of hydrogen peroxide into a, a vat of water. There are a couple ways to do it. You can even do half equal parts water and vinegar. The idea is just to kill any um, potential disease and um, anything that might be residual from your previous growing seasons. Uh, I'm going to lump in trellis and container checkup into the gear maintenance because uh, we get distracted and we get so passionate about what, when things start sprouting and growing and maybe we haven't taken proper inventory on what we have to help assist those plants once they start maturing. Uh, so this is a great time to think about trellising if you want to start incorporating more trellising. If you're going to be growing new varietals um, that will need that assistance, make sure that you have your whole arsenal stocked up and you're ready to go because uh, if you're growing dahlias for the first time, you do need to support those and you wanna make sure you have those tools available and set up before they start flopping over. Uh, same thing with seedlings, a lot of us get carried away and start growing more than we have pots to put them in. So this is a really great time just to kind of look around and make sure that you have all the tools that you need for the projects that you want to achieve. So we talk a lot about location and site prep. This is especially important, not only for beginner gardeners, but also established gardeners. And what, um, when I say established gardeners is things are always changing. Uh, what might be full sun one year might not be this year. Uh, and that is because we live in areas where there are urban trees, you might have planted trees in your yard. Uh, so this is a really great time to reassess your location. And if it worked for you last summer, spring, and if it's gonna work for you this continual um, seasons ahead. Uh, and I, I know this from personal experience, we have uh, some very large eucalyptus trees that border our property and we have those professionally trimmed every two years. And that difference between those two years and the amount of six to eight hours of sunshine I get on some of my garden beds is substantial. Uh, so I do have to rotate my crops based on the type of light I get between those two years. So just something to think about, just think about where your light is, how much light you're getting. Uh, and you know, if you have some shady spots, don't be discouraged, you can still grow things. And we can talk more about that if you have questions about utilizing shady parts of your, of your garden. Um, it's just a nice reminder that just because something worked last year, it's not going to necessarily work year after year. And that's not to be discouraging, that's just to keep your mind open that things change and flex and that you should be flexible with them. Um, we talk a lot about accessibility, especially when building new gardens. Uh, what works, what doesn't, what are your needs? Uh, if you're starting from scratch, what are you looking to achieve? This is like the best case scenario, right? You're starting from scratch and you can build your dream. Uh, it takes time, don't feel overwhelmed. Start with one bed, start with one area. Um, but also keep in mind water sources. You might not have direct access to water. 
Uh, for me personally, a uh, hundred foot hose is my best friend. My garden is way down on the bottom of my property and I don't have running water down there. And a lot of people find that surprising considering I have 12 raised beds in a micro orchard, but you'd be amazed what you can do with a, a set of a hundred foot hoses, which we can talk about more in the watering section. Um, that being said, if you have put new structures on your property, like you've built a greenhouse or you've done a tool shed, could that new structure benefit from doing water capturing on your property? Uh, a lot of us have rain barrels already installed. If you don't, this is a great way. You can actually capture quite a bit. I capture quite a bit off of the, the roof of my, my greenhouse. Um, were your beds deep enough? Are they not tall enough? How are they working for you? Have you, you know, how's your body responding to the amount of work that you're putting into this? This is a great time before our gardens are in overdrive to make some assessments and changes. You can easily add height to your garden beds. You can reconfigure things. It's better to do it now before they're full and thriving with plants. Um, let's see. And then uh, another good idea is just doing an annual soil health check. Um, and you know, if you are using raised beds, you're, you have better control over the soil. Uh, because you can amend that, you can amend your garden soil as well, but um, speaking specifically with raised beds, our summer months are such vigorous growing seasons and oftentimes a lot of us put our beds to sleep during winter and that can cause a lot of harm. Uh, our, our soil becomes over dry, uh, the loss of microbial life is dwindling, uh, so it's a great time right now as we're gearing up for some very heavily growing seasons to start checking for your overall texture, uh, removing any weeds that might be around before, especially before they go to flower or seed and become a much bigger problem for you. Um, check and see if worms are present. This is a great sign to see how the life, the life force of your soil is doing. Um, and this is a great time to just start with even if something as simple as a top dressing of compost uh, and just reviving areas that might be a little bit silent or dried out over the last few months. Uh, just remember the more organic matter you can put in your growing areas, the better. And uh, for some of you that might have areas that you like to have rest between seasons, I highly uh, cannot recommend more thinking about cover crops. I actually did an experiment this winter in my raised beds using cover crops. Uh, and I have been so pleasantly supply, surprised by uh, the the, the texture of the soil under there and the, uh, the life that is still there in areas where I wasn't particularly growing anything. So consider soil um, as a year long project, but I think right now is especially important to take a look and uh, give it more organic matter, give it some compost and get it geared up for the transplanting season ahead. And since we're talking about um, ideas and maybe new gardens or expanding up gardens. I want to just touch really briefly on container gardens. A lot of people think they need to have a massive area to grow and that is not the case. Uh, if you don't have space, don't worry about it. I mean, we can do everything from patio, patio pots, balcony pots. Um, containers are a great way to maximize the sun you have. Even if you're trying something new and, and you don't have a very particularly sunny property, uh, if you do have a sunny patio or balcony, you can use your pot, pots to uh, move around your plants to get the most sun that they need. Um, you can decide when and how your plants get sunlight, shade, and water. And container plants are sometimes less prone to disease and pests because you're refreshing the soil and you have a smaller amount of soil to be managing and keeping its health, uh, health level high. Uh, grow bags are also really wonderful. I particularly like to use grow bags for experimental crops and temporary crops, uh, and especially things that I don't want to take over my garden. Where garlic, a lot of times people don't realize that that's a nine to nine month commitment, and you might not want to be, uh, you know, using half of your garden bed for nine months uh, when you're limited on space. You can easily use grow bags to grow garlic. You can easily use them to grow things that like to spread like potatoes, any tubers, anything that you might not want to be digging out for the rest of your life in one of your beds, a grow bag is a great way to keep that contained literally. Uh, and, and, and experimental projects. If you just wanna try your hand at something, maybe don't wanna use the raised bed space for it, these grow bags can be amazing to do test experiments with because when you're all done, if you decide that you don't wanna do it the next season, they fold up, roll up and you can store it really easily. 
Uh, don't forget that when you're doing container potting, if you're limited, really limited on space, you can plant more than one plant per pot. Uh, and then using techniques such as succession sowing, which um, is the process of repeatedly seeding small amounts throughout the growing season or planting varieties that mature at different times. So you're always having the opportunity to harvest and enjoy your garden, no matter if that's small scale or large. Um, and then never forget about thinking upwards and the, the power of trellises. Uh, they increase the growing footprint of any small space, even in your raised beds. Uh, the vegetables you can use on those are peas, gourds, melons, squash, cucumbers, and of course, tomatoes. Um, and when you're using trellises and you're growing upwards, you're actually opening up that space underneath for more shallow rooted veg. Uh, like radishes and lettuce, which would really grow well in these hotter months in a little bit of park shade. So I think trellises are really a wonderful tool to use in the garden to maximize space, no matter what you're working with. Before we start talking about irrigation, were there any questions coming through for uh, basic, basic garden starting and, or anything? Yes, I have some good ones for you. Okay, let's hear um, them. Okay, I'm going to actually run them backwards here. Uh, Sharon wants to know what are good cover crops for raised beds? Cover crops for raised beds. I had great experience with a mix. You can get a couple different mixes from places like Peaceful Valley Farms, which is like, I believe it's groworganic.com. Um, where the, a lot of these mixes are meant for hillsides or larger areas, they work just as well in your raised bed. Uh, any legume is great because that fixes the nitrogen in the soil. Uh, a lot of people like to use crimson clover as well. I did a mix that was half a pollinator attractor mix, beneficial bud, bug mix. It had a mixture of uh, root veg, like some radishes. It had several different legumes in it. It did have some ryegrass in it and it had crimson clover. Uh, and these all did different, different um, everything that you put in your cover crop mix actually has its own uh, uh, we've got planes coming over, um, has its own uh, job to do. Some aerate the soil better, keep things loose. You know, you're also covering your ground so that there's less water, um, there's more water retention and that you're keeping the soil temperatures down. Uh, so a lot of these cover crops both fix soil health, they maintain the soil health, and they also keep like aeration and organic matter in there for your community of um, soil microbes. So there's a lot of different mixes and options out there that you can go through. You can make your own or you can buy one that's ready and custom. Beautiful. I also personally recommend uh, daikon radish for anybody who oh. has heavily clay soil because that'll just drill down through the ground and break exactly. it up. Exactly. Um, Lorna says she's got a balcony garden this year and wants to know what she needs to do to prepare the soil for the new season. Should she, this is a really good question, should she completely replace the soil that she used for winter crops? So I think that there's a lot of opinions about this and this is depending on what you wanna do. A lot of people will tell you to get rid of all the older soil because it might be tapped of nutrients. And there are a lot of camps that say, don't waste your money and you don't have to do that. So if you're looking to, um, replenish the health of your soil and not necessarily break the bank. Uh, I've, I've had some success and I've read lots of things about only replacing about a third to a half of the soil in the container. But what's important if you are going to do that is that you go through and you make sure that nothing is compacted on the bottom because you wanna make sure that the new roots and everything come through and have healthy soil throughout the size of the pot and have the ability to grow through the size of the pot. So, um, I don't think you have to get rid of everything. It depends what you were growing that season. If it was really hungry and was depriving your soil of nutrients, I would go even a little heavier with some new amendments, throw some compost in there. But I wouldn't say that you have to empty all of your containers. I don't think you have to start fresh every season. I might say that you wanna do a little heavier amendments after summer because that's a more vigorous growing season. If you're just doing some root veg and some lettuce from winter, I don't think you have to replace everything. Thanks. Okay, Emily, rolling back to tool care. She wants to know for disinfecting with hydrogen peroxide, what is the percentage concentration we should use? If you could just give a little bit more info on how to use yeah. peroxide. I believe it was, oh, hold on, let me think. I need to look that up because I don't have it specifically in my head right now. 
um, for when you're doing, what is it? Here, let me see if I can go back. Did I have it listed? I'm gonna find it for you, I'm gonna tell you. It's a different percentage depending on if you're cleaning your shears versus doing your seed containers. If you're doing your seed containers, you need just a very little amount. If let's, um, here's, a, here's an interesting analogy. If you have like a large cooler that you're filling with water, you would just do a cap full or two of hydrogen peroxide in that and then dunk your uh, seed trays in. For the spray, I need to get back to you on that one because I actually don't use hydrogen peroxide on my spray of my shears. So may, I'm gonna make a note of that and I will get back to you. The other, the other thing we can do on that, if you'd like, Kristen, is if you want to circle back and pass that info over to Jessica, we can put it as a tip in our next newsletter. Yes, let's do it. Perfect. Okay, and now I'm going to butcher this name and I apologize. Arcana, Archana, who lives in Ojai, um, is doing her first raised bed garden place she's it's on a non-stabilized decomposed granite and there's wheat tarp underneath and clay and the question is should the weed cloth be removed to encourage earthworms and co-mingling with the native soil the bed is 15 inches high for reference i'd be surprised if you really need the weed the weed paper i have uh three foot tall beds on very similar ground uh, the only concern I would have uh, would be the gophers popping through, which I haven't had. I have had zero weed issues. I think you could save your money and not use weed paper. I mean, that might be just a personal opinion. Um, I think it's a personal preference, but I do like the idea of letting the native soil mingle with your soil and allowing that passageway to be open. I don't think with, I don't think you'll have problems with weeds if you've gotten rid of them before placing the beds down. Good. Okay, and um, I don't know if you're planning on getting into pest control at all. Oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They might not like a... how I'm going to talk about it, but we can, re we can, re how about we save it for when we get down there? Yeah, well, just, just so you know, Victor is looking for tips on the yearly battle with spider mites. And I think everyone ah. in this area can relate. Yeah. So we're just, we're going to shelf that question until okay. later. Okay. And oh. that catches us up for the moment. Thanks. Okay, amazing. So I'm going to keep moving because I see that we're already at the halfway mark. Um, irrigation and being water wise. And then we're going to start getting into some kind of more conceptual ideas. I'm going to hit pest control. Don't worry, because I feel like that's everyone's hot button. Everyone's hot button. Um, OK, so irrigation and water rise. I think this is a great time of year to reassess what worked and what didn't. If you don't have things already installed, it's a great time to implement them. Uh, if you do have existing setups on your in your landscaping and in your beds, this is a really great time to do an annual checkup. Nothing's foolproof. Things break. Animals take bites out of hoses. It's a really great time before your plants are in and getting mature and established. Uh, and crowding the area to really get in and make sure that there aren't any leaks, cracks. Uh, drip is notorious for getting plugged holes. Uh, make sure that if you do have lands, uh, landscaping sprinklers that heads aren't broken. Uh, we had a water wise presentation for the Master Gardener group a couple weeks ago and uh, it was it was a good reminder that a lot of our irrigation runs when we're asleep or before we're awake. So it's good to just have it run during the day so you can go check everything really quick and make sure there aren't any leaks because um, that can be really detrimental to uh, wasting water in your water bill. Um, and if you don't have drip irrigation installed, I think this is a great time to consider it. Uh, I know it seems intimidating to install, but there are so many kits and there's so many configurations these days and there are so many options, which is on the other spectrum overwhelming. Um, it's just really something to consider if you're doing raised bed gardening, container gardening, uh, it, because applying water directly to the soil surface is actually the most resource efficient way to irrigate your plants. And in the summer months when we're dealing with more uh, powdery mildew and, and leaf disease, eliminating any overhead watering is going to be your best bet in keeping your plants healthy and drip irrigation is the best way to do that. So um, there's options for every setup and you don't need a water line. I mean, like I said, I have no water access all the way down there and I use a combination of a hundred foot hose, hose splitters, and I, I have some attachments that that actually runs my drip for me and it is fantastic. So 
there are a lot of things I can talk about that more specifically if you have questions about your beds and that might be its own presentation in itself. But I want to encourage you to start thinking about drip and putting that in your garden because it's gonna save you a lot of time and headache. Um, I do like to personally hand water a lot of things. There is something very meditative about it, but let's be true as things get more mature and grow and things, schedules get busy, uh, that can be one extra thing on your plate that you might not need to do. And a lot of people always wonder, how much do I water? How often do I water? It really depends on uh, what you're growing, what time of year it is, how the weather has been. Uh, but what I can say is always water early in the morning so the water has a chance to seep in, there's less evaporation. Uh, I would start with, you know, when transplants, you water more frequently and then you start spacing off to one or two times a week, depending on what you're growing. And most importantly, soil coverage with either mulch or multiple plantings will keep the moisture retention high and the soil temperature low, which is your goal here. And I just wanted to touch on three things really quick about um, three gadgets that I really am a fan of. Some are new to me, some I've used forever um, in smarter watering in your garden. A new to me one that I'm going to be implementing in my raised beds this spring is the shrubbler. I love the name, I love what it does. Uh, the, so the shrubbler is this little tiny head that you can attach onto your drip line with another extension hose and you can place it anywhere you want in your bed. That being said, you can give more water and attention to one plant. You can take away water and attention from one plant. Um, and I love that it has a, an adjustable head so you can control the flow of the water. This little gadget just has opened my eyes to how I can customize the ever-changing needs of raised beds. Because a lot of people think, well, I've got the grid down, I've got the, the drip down, but my crops change every season. This little tool will help you re-divert water into different areas as needed depending on what you're growing. So this is high on my list. I have ordered it, it is coming, I am putting it in my bed. So I wanna share the love and let you know about this, this cute little thing. Um, another thing I really love is a flow water meter, especially if you're someone who has native plants or citrus plants that require a lot of deep irrigation. And when I'm talking deep irrigation, a lot of people don't realize when you're watering native, native plants or getting them um, established, they need two to five gallons of water per plant. Uh, so a water flow meter, if you're hand watering, is a great way to understand how much water you're using. Some of these actually have shutoff time, so you can set it for so many gallons, you can set it for so many minutes. That's really great if you're doing deep soaks for your citrus and your fruit trees as well. And then I'm just gonna note one more time, a heavy duty hose splitter is my best friend. Spend the extra couple dollars, get the metal one. There's nothing more uh, rewarding than actually doing double duty in the garden. So there are times where I'm running my drip and I might need to have a, a watering can full. Little victories, it'll save you headaches in the end. I love a hose splitter. Even if you don't have it set up all the time, just having one on hand is really nice. All right, so we're gonna dip in really quickly about seed starting basics. I think this could be its own topic completely, but I just wanna open your eyes to a couple different ways of doing things. If you've done something a particular way every year or you're new to this, I just kinda of wanna give you some ideas of different ways of starting your seeds. Um, so there are a couple different container ideas you can do. Uh, 50 to 72 cell starting trays are really lovely if you're short on space, especially if you're starting things indoors before transplanting. Um, it's you can start more seeds per footprint. And it's really great because you can bottom soak your seed germination. A lot of times when we're overhead watering those delicate uh, saplings, they can get a little damaged. So these 72 and 50, that has to do with the size of how many are in the tray. Um, you soak them from underneath. And I find that that really helps in germination. But I should note if you're growing larger plants such as tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, you'll need other containers to upside and let them grow and mature a little bit more before transplanting to your garden. Uh, another way of starting seeds are in either wooden or plastic flats. Uh, flats are a great choice if you're planning on transplanting seedlings into the garden as clumps. I do this method for my greens. Uh, it's great for lettuce, it's great for other things because you're actually just going to get into the, the uh, flat and scoop out a number grouping of seedlings and then plant them directly into the garden. And of course, you don't have to buy anything at all. So I'm here to tell you, don't feel like you have to go out and buy everything that you don't need. Uh, so 
save your nursery pots. If you bought plants at the nursery, save those and reuse those. Egg cartons work, bottoms and milk jugs work, anything works. Terracotta pots, just make sure they don't dry out because they will. And um, as long as it has good drainage, use it. I mean, don't feel limited. Just try starting seeds in anything. And then I wanted to just talk briefly about germination mediums. So often people wonder if potting soil mix is the way to go. Of course it works. Uh, it is a little bit heavy though sometimes for our little saplings and our little germination sprouts to come up through the soil line. So I've been experimenting a lot with soilless germination. And basically um, the, best use, the best reason for utilizing this medium is you can control the types of insects, disease, bacteria, and any weed spores or seeds um, that might be found in prepackaged garden soils. Um, the other benefit with a, a DIY grow mix is you're lightening the soil, you're aiding in its drainage, and you're allowing yourself for a higher germination rate. So this is pretty easy to do. Um, I would say mostly the most simple recipe you could do in a soilless germination mix is one part perlite or vermiculite and one part coconut core. I'm gonna heavily push coconut core today because it is a sustainable replacement for peat moss. And then if you're into soilless germination and sustainability, I would like to also um, talk about soil blocking really quick. This is a seed starting technique that I have started over the last few years and I really enjoy it. Uh, it uh, has some incredible benefits and it's incredibly sustainable. Uh, the be benefits being um, there are stronger roots due to more oxygen flow. So if you're unfamiliar with soil blocking, basically what you're doing is you're creating a soilless mixture. You're compacting it into cubes using these tools here that I have in this photo. And you're creating these cubes that the, so that the seed germinates. And you place the seed just on the top. You don't bury the seed at all. And then you water it from underneath. It has a beautiful germination rate. It has stronger roots because oxygen's coming in from all sides where it would normally be through a plastic pot. Um, and that being said, you have stronger roots, so you have less transplanting shock. And you don't have anything that goes root bound in your pots. So we're talking about really healthy plants that you're setting yourself up to success the minute you're taking them from seed starting to your garden. And of course, it's a no waste alternative. You're not gonna be spending the money and wasting plastic growing pots or seed trays that are flimsy and end up in the landfill. So I've um, put a very simple soil blocking mix here. If you're interested in trying it, I'm happy to answer some more specific questions about it. They come in a range of sizes. What I like about it is you can get these systems where you start your seeds in these very small quarter inch cubes. And then when you're ready to upsize, you create the one inch cubes that have an indentation that you can fit your quarter inch inside of. So you can expand upon the size and you can continue to grow your soil blocks before the time that they go into the garden. I think it's a really amazing system. And this is my obligatory compost. I know there's a lot of new laws in place that are confusing everybody, but if you aren't composting already, this is my due diligence to tell you that you have no more excuses and you must. And I really wanna encourage you to not throw your compost into the green or gray uh, bins that they're asking, the city's asking you to, but to actually produce compost on your own property to use for your own garden, because it is so easy. People are so intimidated, but it's so easy. And the truth is there are now options for every space. You can live in an apartment, you can have a balcony, you can have a full homestead. There are options and different sizes for you. I love the double-sided tumbler because you can have two compartments working at different time rates. You can pull from them at different times, but I have the space for that. So there's other variations and small things. Don't feel like you have to have a pitchfork and be out there and turning it. If that's not for you, there's a, there's a bin for you that will work. And speaking of work, you can let the worms do it for you. So I also have a vermicompost. And this is, uh, if you're not familiar, it is the easiest way to compost. Basically you're putting your kitchen vegetable scraps and your fruit scraps. I would um, advise not to do citrus just because the worms don't eat it. Um, you put it into this tiered bin. The worms are, they are voracious. They eat so quickly through your, through your food scraps. And in turn, you get this super high nutrient uh, worm castings that you can turn into a tea for your garden. And this, this worm tea fertilizer is five times more nitrogen, 
seven times more phosphorus, phosphorus and 11 times more potassium than your ordinary soil. So it is just crazy. It is, you want to dilute it because if you put too much on certain plants might freak out a little bit, but I cannot recommend if you are interested in composting, but feel like it's a little too much work, start with a vermicompost bin. And I'm happy to talk about those options as well. And just if you aren't familiar with composting, it's really easy. You need your browns, you need your greens, and you need equal parts of that. And if it's drying out, you need water to keep it active. So really quick, just because I think the majority of us are here in Southern California or California in general. So I wanted to give you some inspiration and just remind you what it is time to grow right now. So here's, if you wanna screenshot this or take a photo of it, we can also provide it later. This is just a really quick overview of what you can plant now. Of course, everything's always changing because the weather has been crazy, but in theory, this is what you can plant right now and hopefully nothing goes and bolts and when it turns 90 degrees again. And then very quickly, I wanted to talk about companion planting when we're trying to do our spring prep because companion planting might open your mind to the different types of things that we're putting in our garden. Uh, choosing the right plants to combine to, in a space uh, is really maximizing your every square foot uh, and using different plants that won't fight for the same resources, uh, such as like growing carrots with lettuce. One has a deeper root system while some, the other is going to be more shallow on top and these really coexist wonderfully while really maximizing your space. Um, appropriately matched companion plants will provide insect control for the entire space and flowers will, um, adding flowers in, I think com uh, companion gardening with flowers is game changing. You're going to be attracting your pollinators, your beneficial insects. Uh, and we're gonna go through a little bit more about using plants as pest control in a minute, but um, I cannot recommend, there are many books on companion planting and many different combinations. Uh, but if you have not, I like PDs here. Um, if you have not uh, experimented with companion planting, you will be surprised in the results of better tasting produce, more healthy produce, less pests, less disease, healthier soil. So I cannot, I cannot um, recommend this more if you want to take a screen grab of this or we could share it as well. All right, so this might be a controversial slide. <laughs> because I know so often we wanna talk about pest control and we want to just eliminate the problem, right? And we need to rethink that. So you can actually avoid or minimize the damage from many pests and diseases by giving your plants good, good growing conditions so they're strong and vigorous. Healthier plants have the ability to defend themselves and creating an ecosystem within your garden will attract the right types of bugs and wildlife that will do a lot of the work for you. Um, and when we're talking about giving them the right growing conditions, that means enough sun, the healthiest soil as possible, the right amount of water, proper space and airflow, and correct planting time. Sometimes we're planting things at the wrong time. Our weather is, you know, things are out of our control always. There's always that factor. But I really want you to rethink this spring about preparing yourself for pests in a different way. And that is by introducing different techniques to your garden. Um, first off, I'm gonna say, slow your roll. Don't reach for, even if it's just the insecticidal soap or the neem oil. A lot of times we are so fast to try to fix the problem that we are cutting in front of nature, trying to do its, its uh, job. And I would say that specifically with aphids. Uh, aphids come in, they multiply so fast and uh, here you are, you're like, I'm ready to spray. But what you don't realize is that the ladybugs have already come through and laid their eggs and you haven't seen that process happen yet. So by spraying that plant and killing that, you're not only going to be damaging the, um, the future larva or the success of that larva hatching, um, you're not providing any food for them once they do. So the cycle is broken. So if we can have a little bit of patience and allow nature to step in, I think you'd be really surprised. Increasing that timeline and trying to see if nature can come and take a step in.
parts are really even good for our good bugs. So we have to keep that in mind. I know it's really hard to do when, you know, that hornworm is eating all your tomatoes, like your one tomato plant, that's all you wanted. And that hornworm is there. I understand. I understand. So I wanted to just kind of talk about some, uh, some plant-based options for pest control, just to kind of open your mind, not only in types of plants that you can add to your garden this spring in terms of spring prep, but just kind of opening your minds a little bit about uh, what can be, how, what a force of nature actually can do. So um, really quickly, these are trap crops and repellers. Uh, trap crops are essentially plants chosen for their effectiveness in terms of attracting targeted pests. It's basically a sacrificial lamb of your garden. I know that sounds crazy, especially if you have limited space in planting, but when done correctly and in small scale, it actually works wonder. One of my favorite trap crops is nasturtium. I plant nasturtium all around my garden and the aphids will go there first before any of my greens, hands down. And I always have extra growing in the greenhouse or in containers ready to replace when I need to yank that out and compost it. I just did a really quick list here for you to get, get an idea of different kinds of repelling plants, trap crop plants, and how you can implement those in your garden. And when I say implement, I mean putting them right around in the sense of companion planting within your raised beds, within your container plots, having secondary containers nearby, uh, and really making them part of your own garden ecosystem. And since we're talking about bugs, let's talk about getting in those pollinators and beneficials as well. Um, like I said in the past slide, flowers are a huge, even if you're not a flower person, adding blooms to your garden are gonna do wonders for you. Um, so I'd really like for everybody to consider blooms this spring in terms of their garden prep and, and plant offerings. Um, take your companion planting one step further and bring your own bug eating army. Um, cosmos, chamomile, calendula, chrysanthemum, Forage is one of my favorite. It is so easy to grow. It thrives on neglect. The bees love it. It actually, it deters hornworm from your tomato, if you can believe it. So if you can put some borage in your garden, you're going to be very, very happy. Um, and then there's marigolds as well that you can put in. And all these flowers attract ladybugs, lacewing, hoverflies, all the important insects that we need that will take care of our aphid, therps, and other dis destructive pests. Um, and in terms of pollen and nectar rich offerings, um, I want you to think about um, attracting the bees. I know we're always talking about attracting the bees, but in terms of what those flowers are, you might be surprised. Something as easy as coneflower or bachelor button Dahlias, if you love a cut flower, dahlias are great and are actually really easy to, to intersperse within a vegetable raised bed. Daisies, lavender, and snapdragon is proven if you plant that because the bloom season of snapdragon actually is right before your tomatoes will bloom. You're actually training the bees to come through for pollen. And so they'll already have that on their radar. And the hope is, is that crosses over for once those snapdragons are finishing, they'll continue on to your tomatoes and help pollinate those. So just a few planting tips on flowers. A lot of times we'll just think they can put one or two plants here and there and then when we're done, we did our job. But actually set yourself up for success and plant large clusters in multiples of the same plant to entice insects because they're gonna be more likely to visit an area where there are more blooms present. So think about this as garden borders around your raised bed, within your raised bed. The closer you get your blooms to your edible garden, the more cross pollination and beneficial bugs will overlap between the two. Now I'm gonna talk briefly about native plants and habitat. And I know that's probably, why is that part of my spring planning? That is not what I had in mind. And I understand that. And this is for long-term plan, because I think, you know, we're talking about pest control and everything and having native plants and creating a healthy ecosystem are so important to the health of your garden and the longevity of your garden that I wanted to take the opportunity to put this in your mind um, as part of your spring prep in terms of thinking outside of your garden beds and thinking about the whole scale and scope of what your garden could be. Um, but I think maybe we'll take a question break before I dive into this, just in case. Were there anything that came through? We have one outstanding question at the moment which is uh, Eileen who wants to know how often should she deep soak her fruit trees? 
does it depend on the fruit tree? I was advised, I have mostly citrus. I was advised there's a great organization called Fruit Institute here in Los Angeles. And I believe they are still the only fruit tree focused care company in the city. And they are fantastic and they have a lot of free of education. And the gal who runs that uh, had recommended to me to do a deep soak once a month. Um, and that was a very low drip for about one to two hours. And if you have a flow meter, you could get that to the gallon. Um, I could not tell you how much your particular tree needs because it depends on the maturity of it and the size. Um, but I do believe, especially in the warmer months or before a freeze, strangely enough, is the best time to water to prepare your plants. Um, but I would say for any fruit tree um, that is established, so I'm going to say at least three or four years old, you're probably going to be wanting to water it once a month. Thank that you. might not and be we, helpful. That might not be specific enough for you, but. We still have the open question from Victor on spider oh, Victor, mites. Victor, your spider mites. I spider know. mites are. When I say spider mites, I rip out the damn plants. Same, um, same. <laughs> <laughs> there are two, I have two really sore spots when it comes to pest control, and that is spider mites and that is uh, powdery mildew. And usually I just am like, before, well, one, okay, right, we have to all be paying attention with any plant care. The true, the true green thumb is that how much attention you're paying to your plant and the, how quick can you spot the problem. But I do feel like in our climate, spider mites are just a battle that cannot be won. So I don't know if anybody else has some advice for poor Victor. I feel your pain, Victor. Um, <laughs> but I do, I tend to, I'll go through two approaches. One, I'll see if the plant was in the wrong area. Oftentimes it's on my eggplant and it's often because it's not getting enough sun. And I feel like I chose the wrong area. And in time, if it's not too mature, I have relocated the plant after stripping the leaves and trying to figure out how to get rid of, I mean, I do a lot of mechanical pest control because I really try to limit what I spray, if anything. In a very rare instance, if I am trying to hold on to deer life for something that got attacked by powdery mildew, I will use a co copper infecticide, insecticide or copper spray, um, but I really try not to. I would love to hear other people's opinions on spider mites because I'm with you. I feel, I feel like they are invincible. <laughs> but that's if you catch it too late, right? Yeah. Victor, I yeah. did not answer your question. I am so sorry. <laughs> um, I do, I do want to say for powdery mildew, I've actually found a milk spray to be effective. Oh, really? Yeah, the, the one part milk to 10 parts water. But you got to catch it early and you got to yeah. do it to a great degree prophylactically. Yeah. So it's just dripping on all sides of the leaves, correct? Yeah. Well, you know, if, if you've got a spray bottle, you spray on the bottom and on the top of the leaves. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I also have found that if I ignore it, it doesn't <laughs> hurt. It doesn't hurt the fruits. Right. I mean, so. I think that that's where I'm going to stand too. If you have already set your plant up to be healthy and the soil is healthy and it's getting everything it needs, a lot of times it can shake it off. And that has been true. I've had a little bit of powdery mildew just from our spikes in temperature are crazy and then followed by rain on some of my uh, Swiss chard and um, it went away, <laughs> which was, was fantastic. Yeah. Um, I know that's not the case for everybody. I'm not saying, I don't want to get your hopes up. I, it, it, pests and disease do happen and that's just part of, part of what we have to deal with. Now, Crystal wants to know about white flies. White flies. I have not had a lot of experience personally with white flies. Have any of you? I found that just about any kind of fly gets remediated with the yellow sticky trap and you can mm -hmm. make your own homemade traps with a uh, Vaseline and yellow card stock. But I buy a lot of sticky fly traps for, because I have chickens mm -hmm. and we get every kind of fly imaginable. And yeah. I was just out looking this morning at one of them that uh, I had in the chicken yard that had tons and tons, not just of, you know, black soldier flies, but also these tiny little, some sort of a fruit fly stuck to them. 
And I've used them throughout the garden too for white flies, black flies, you know, any, any kind of flies that get stuck to stuff. And the yellow, it's got to be with the yellow though, because the yellow is what attracts them. Right. Yeah, get your sticky, get your sticky tacks up. Yeah. All right, well, I'm gonna go really quick just for timing. Uh, yes, over at 11. I'm gonna do this really, really quick because I know a lot of you weren't here for natives and ecosystems, but I think it's important. So if you have a couple of minutes to stay on, I'm gonna go through this very, very fast. Um, I wanna encourage everybody to start thinking about, uh, it's not the right time of year really to put natives in the ground, but I wanna put this in your ear since you're here today. Uh, November through January is actually the best time to plant natives because a lot of people think that they're so hard and they're so difficult. And the truth is, is we just don't plant them at the right time. They're sold year round. They should be put in the fall. They should, they want their water in the winter months. They do not want water, water in the summer months. And why I think it's important for you is not only the idea of management versus maintenance because native plants do not require fertilizers. They use less water, they require less work. They're wonderful in so many ways. They've reduced air pollution. I put some numbers here because a lot of people get moved by the numbers. I mean, 57,000 gallons of water versus 6,000, 80 hours versus 15 hours of maintenance. You know, this is really gonna make your garden beautiful, but not only that, it's better for your edible garden. A lot of people don't think natives and edibles go hand in hand. And that is because of our native bees. Um, they're the most efficient pollinators that we have. Specifically, the squash bee is our native bee, and it is one of the only, it can, it's the only one that's going to be pollinating our squash. How many of us have had to hand pollinate squash? That is because we don't have enough native bees present. So I really encourage you, this is a totally different topic, and I've done classes on natives elsewhere, that I really want you to consider adding some natives to your vegetable garden areas because in turn, you will be bringing in more of those beneficial bugs, you will bringing in the wildlife and they can actually be very helpful in your gardening even though you think that they're being destructive, but the truth is that they're not. And that being said, I wanna to touch briefly on wildlife habitat. It's very easy to get certified as a wildlife habitat. I am here. Um, the importance being the birds, the bees and the lizards. Uh, birds will not only aid in your pest control, they will give you free fertilizer if they're in your beds, they will loosen your soil. Um, and, give, and when you give them the right habitat, and you're gonna find this very surprising because a lot of people are like, why do I want the birds coming and eating my, my vegetables? If you provide them the right habitat, they're gonna actually prefer the native berries, the native seeds, the native fruits and, um, versus your garden. And they're also going to prefer if you give them a drinking hole, if you give them a little bird bath, we can actually train birds to go there for water versus eating our fruit trees and our tomatoes. Um, I read a scientific report saying that the majority of birds that come into a garden that are taking just a couple nibbles out of this tomato, a couple nibbles out of this um, stone fruit is because they're thirsty. They don't want to actually eat your food. Uh, so if we actually provide them a watering place, you're going to be driving them to one specific area away from your garden. And if we plant natives around like elderberry, toy on for berries, um, sages for seeds, if you leave the seed pods on, you will see so much life come into your garden and they're gonna stick around and eat your caterpillars too. Um, bees as well, just really quick once again, focusing specifically on the 25,000 plus solitary bees. Um, these bees can pollinate about 2000 flowers versus a honeybee that will only pollinate 15, even though they're visiting the same area. So I really wanna encourage you, if you don't have a little Mason Bee Hotel or areas that encourage their habitat, to really invite them into your garden. And lastly, I've been reading a lot of reports on lizards and how the uh, presence of lizards in your garden is a huge success. Um, they're vulnerable to pollutants and their existence in the garden actually indicates low levels of pesticides and heavy metals. So the more lizards you have in the garden, the better your garden health is. Um, and studies have also proven that the blood of the Western fence lizard has the ability to neutralize Lyme disease and ticks, which is pretty incredible. So just really quick here, which I'm gonna end off on, if you're interested in creating a wildlife habitat for your garden, it's very easy to do. There's more information online at the National Wildlife Federation. Just wanted to plug this in your ear as part of your spring prep to possibly also include food, water cover, places to raise young, and of course, continue your sustainable practices as part of your spring garden prep and beyond. So. That's what I have for you today. If there's any specific questions, um, 
I'd love to address them. If you have the time to stick around, I'm happy to stick around later and answer them for you. So thank you so much for being here. I know that was a lot of information and a lot of information that we could expand upon even further. Um, but I'm thank you for thinking about spring garden prep in a new way with me today. Wow. This has been a great presentation. I was a little fast and furious, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, Greg's got a good question. How do you provide water for birds without creating mosquito hatcheries? Okay, there's a couple ways to do this um, and some easier than others. So I have a bird fountain that doubles as a bee fountain. But when I say that, you always wanna create a shallow, um, implement rocks. So there's kind of like a shoreline for them to come in. Um, I use a, cause I don't have power or water out down there. I use a solar powered uh, bubbler. So you can get fountain bubblers that just float on top and they, you can adjust the different things. There's also called a water wiggler, which is the opposite. And it sits on top and it just jiggles the water a little bit like this. So if you can just oscillate the water a tiny bit, you won't have any issues, but of course, you want to go through there and especially when we have these hotter peaks of weather, go through and scrub, dump it out, refresh the water. Um, you can also get these, uh, these things called mosquito bites or like little pellets. Some people swear by them. I don't personally put them in the bird feeder at all times. If I feel like there might be a spike in mosquito larva, I might throw them in. There are some people who swear by this and that's creating mosquito lures. And that's basically taking a Home Depot bucket, putting some hay in it, the larvae like to feed on algae. So keep that in mind. If you have any sort of scummy buildup in any of your water sources, that's going to attract them. So the thought is you attract the mosquitoes to lay the eggs in this, throw the mosquito bait in, which kills the larva. Um, lots of studies say it's it, to control a mosquito population, it's better to focus on the larva than the adults. So. Excellent. Um. Oh, okay. Yeah, Crystal just posted something. What was that too? In the chat. Oh, snuck. Yes, that is that is the uh, that is where I got. Okay, Crystal did a presentation for us on edible uh, edible uh, natives. And I was so intrigued that I went and tracked down some white tepary beans. Ooh. These are my favorite beans ever. I've cooked them twice now and they were, no matter what you do to them, they're delicious. They've got a slightly sweet and sort of nutty flavor. And um, Snug is the company that I got them from Crystal. I also took nine beans, stuck them in a bag and did a sprout test and got a, like out of the nine, I got six of them sprouting, which is a pretty, pretty good return for something that is not intended for growing. Um, I have some from another company that I'm going to try to test again. Plus I've got some black tepary beans and a couple of other native beans. Um, this is completely as an aside, but if you've never grown, the thing that's great is once you get them established, you don't need to water them because they're native, they're drought tolerant. Um, anyway, yeah, I have one that I stuck in a uh, container in my, my, where I'm growing, you know, my plants for spring and it is already like three inches high. Wow. So. Um, do we have any other questions here for, for our presenter while we've got her here? There's a lot to cover today. I'm, I'm, thank you for everyone's attention and interest. Is it possible to make your deck available? Sure, I'm happy to. Okay, yeah, we that can send it out with our newsletter, um, even the PDF version, um, that's the easiest, I think. Yeah. And if anyone has specific questions, I'm happy to give my contact information and, um, and chat with you about specific things too, if there were questions that might come up later. Okay, great. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah. Well, thank and you. Go ahead, Sue. Greg is going to follow up on getting the information on the, the tool care into our next newsletter as a little tip. 
regarding okay. this tip. So, um, wow, this was a great presentation. I put my uh, put my email, and if you are interested in connecting on Instagram, I do a lot of uh, Q and A's there as well. So, um, feel free to reach out there if that's an easier place for you to get in touch. So, I'm I'm open to to help you all get kicked started whether you're starting a new garden or patio garden or anything so um i always have the joke that i'm the the garden hotline so if you have a question you can call me <laughs> <laughs> awesome thank you so much Kristen, um and thank you everybody who's uh attended today